about four years ago, I moved to San Francisco and started helping organize for the Bay Area OWASP chapter. Um, well, in uh, SF, I was a sales engineer for Bug Crowd, helped them sell a bunch of um, bug bounty programs and help customers run bug bounty programs for a few years. And then uh, a little bit over a year ago, I joined um, the internal security team at Segment. So the slides are already online. Um, you don't need to take pictures of everything. Uh, if there's links and stuff, just uh, take a picture of this slide and then uh, grab them. Uh, this is also at the end, so if you're not sure, uh, you will have another chance to grab all these links. So I wanted to just list a couple influential presentations for uh, me, especially, and also the team at Segment. Um, these are some of the things that have really shaped about uh, like how we're building a security program. Uh, another thing that I wanted to promote a little bit is this book. I have no affiliation with it, but I read it over our, our winter break at Segment, and I think it captures a lot of the things that uh, we think about when we're rolling out security uh, training and features and the way that we interact with the rest of our company. So a couple of my favorite quotes. Uh, the first one is, effective security teams should measure themselves by what they enable, not by what they block. Um, I think that traditionally a lot of security teams have gotten a reputation for saying no to a bunch of stuff, um, which is what we try to avoid. We try to help people s say yes safely um, or no, but uh, like here's a, a way that you can still achieve what you're looking to do. Another is uh, vulnerabilities are just bugs. The more bugs in your code, the more vulnerabilities. Uh, developers fix bugs all the time. They're used to fixing bugs. Vulnerabilities are just a bug with a security impact, they should get prioritized just like every other bug um, based off of how it could impact our customers. I think everyone's seen some variation, probably less fun version of this graph, um, but developers are the ones that are doing most of this work. Uh, they're the ones that are writing the software design docs, they're the ones that are doing the testing. Um, we're there throughout the process helping them, but uh, they need to be able to make good security decisions on their own. Um, and if they can make those decisions earlier, it's a lot cheaper and faster for them to fix a bug uh, by not writing it than it is for us to find it a year later after it's already been in production and a bunch of stuff has already been slapped on top of it and now you have to change a bu bunch of uh, like unrelated stuff. This next one might sound a little controversial at first just because I know everyone's really into like automation and stuff like that. Um, this isn't saying don't use automation. Uh, you need to find ways to reduce your operational work. Um, but basically what this is saying is people making good decisions earlier in the process uh, are going to provide more value. Um, this is, I'm just going to paraphrase like a larger section that this is in, but it's basically uh, security tools have improved a lot over the last decade, um, but you're going to not have to worry about a bunch of the vulnerabilities that tools find by making good framework choices. So at Segment, we really don't worry about SQL injection or cross site uh, scripting or cross-site request forgery because of the tech choices uh, that our application team have made. And so uh, by making good choices like that up front, you don't need tools as much. And then uh, this last one, which is kind of tied to the, the previous quote, make it easy for someone to write secure code and you'll get secure code. Uh, developers like to uh, have things easy for them. I like to have things that are easy for me. I think people like doing things uh, that are easy. Uh, so make it easy for people to do the right thing. So this is a lightning talk, so there's not as much to get through, um, but I'm probably still going to run over. Um, these are the couple things that we're going to talk about. The first one's building a team and a program. Uh, the second is our approach to training, uh, which uh, our head of security, Colleen, talked a little bit about in um, the panel that she was on earlier today. Uh, the next one is uh, how you get developers to use uh, the expensive stuff that you buy for them. Um, and then the last one is how you work uh, directly with engineering teams to build stuff. So organizational buy-in. The most important thing is you need the whole company to care about security. This isn't something where you can just uh, buy a security team and buy some security products. Uh, you need executive buy-in and you need actual actions from them. Um, to do this, you probably need a, a passionate head of security that can actually translate uh, what you're working on to the executive level and make them understand things. Um, but if you don't have security buy-in from the top down, uh, I would probably look for another job because it's definitely an employee's market right now and there's tons of companies uh, that want uh, to hire talented people. Also, um, you need 
Security headcount, you can't do this stuff uh, with just a few people. Uh, if you have a complicated organization, you need people with different talents, and so you need people that uh, can work with the org and understand the rest of the business. And then also, probably most importantly, uh, is once you have that stuff, is you need a good relationship with your engineers. You need uh, your EMs and your PMs, they need to allocate time for patching, bug fixes, reviews, threat modeling, all that good stuff. Uh, I don't have time to talk about our threat modeling process, but uh, check out Jonathan's presentation from uh, AppSec California last year. It's really good and it definitely informed uh, the way that we think about threat modeling a lot. So building a team, uh, the things that we've had a lot of uh, success with are going to stuff like this, uh, sponsoring meetups, speaking at conferences. Uh, we try to sponsor a couple meetups per year. It's really not that expensive. It's like a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars to have eighty to hundred security people come to your office and hang out and uh, you get to meet them your recruiters get to meet them um, and we've definitely found people from our teams from doing stuff like that if you can get developers to go to that is definitely a huge bonus um, segment has been involved with the day of security conference and meetup series up in the Bay Area and we've gotten some of our developers to go to that and they've uh, Really enjoyed that, and one of them is actually speaking at the, the next meetup that we're hosting, which is awesome. Another way to meet great people is to get involved in open source projects. Uh, David is speaking tomorrow about uh, some open source work he did for the Zap proxy. Uh, he created a really cool heads up display so you don't have to constantly switch between your browser and your proxy. So if you're interested in that, go check that out. And then um, you can also uh, check out uh, our head of security's talk from B-Sides from a couple years ago if you're somebody that is building a team or, or managing a team. So shifting left, everybody's heard this. Uh, I think it's something that the marketing teams at some vendors have done a really good job promoting, but I actually do think that this is really important because developers want to build good software, and in 2019 and probably even in 2000, uh, that means having secure software. Uh, this is just a component of building a good piece of software, just like uh, efficiency or scalability or any of the other components that uh, people praise in a, a piece of software. But to do this, you need devs to be security-minded, and that's what security's job is. You need them. Uh, you need a security team that can work with developers and teach them how to think about things in a secure way and be a resource for them while they're thinking about whatever the next thing that they're going to build that's going to make your company money. We're not helicopter parents. We're not pair programming with all of our developers. We don't have nearly enough people to do that, and I don't want to do that. Um, so you just need to teach them uh, to make good decisions on their own. So how do we do that? Uh, we do some training when somebody joins Segment. Um, within their first few weeks, the first one is think like an attacker. Um, so we run a bug bounty program. We do pen testing. We look for stuff on our own. We try and teach them how to think uh, like we do when we put on our attacker hat and sunglasses. And then the second one is uh, secure code review. So uh, what to look for in a pull request, what to think about when you're designing a system, and then what resources are available as you're uh, working through that. So uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, here's a bunch of reviews that our developers have given us. Um, Colleen talked about this a little bit earlier, but people genuinely do like taking our training. Um, and I think that uh, that's pretty rare because a lot of people complain about security training. The way that we make this relevant is we focus on stuff that has actually been found in segment, whether this is something that a bug bounty person found, or a pen tester found, or something that we found. Uh, it's way easier to get somebody to care about something if you're talking about it in the context of your company, instead of using that abstract C-Surf bank example about transferring money to somebody's account that everybody's seen. Um, we also start introducing the bug crowd VRT. Uh, the VRT is vulnerability rating taxonomy. And we just use this as a way to show our uh, internal developers how we're thinking about these vulns from a priority standpoint. And uh, like when they see these types of vulnerabilities in the future, they already have some anchoring in their head for like, OK, how bad is this? Um, and how, you know, how quickly do I need to fix it? For our training to teach people how to think like an attacker, we use OWASP Juice Shop. Uh, Juice Shop is somewhat similar to our tech, st tech stack. And so it's a lot easier for developers to uh, understand what they're looking for when it's similar to what they're already used to developing. Uh, our general schedule is we talk about a couple vulnerability categories and then we do some interactive training where they actually find the same types of bugs that we just told them about. 
Um, and then we just go through that a couple of times and we find that that's a really good way to get people excited about finding bugs and then they actually understand, okay, here's what happens with cross-site scripting. As we're going through the training, uh, we are writing their names up on a whiteboard. And so as people are finding vulnerabilities, they're also competing with all the other engineers that are in their hiring class. And we found that that uh, definitely gets people more excited about taking the training seriously instead of just like looking at Slack. It's like you don't want to be the only person whose name isn't on the board. Um, after the training, we translate this to our security leaderboard. So everything that you do uh, that we remember to add points for, you get points for. Um, whether that's fixing a vulnerability or posting an interesting article, article into our security channel, um, uh, we want to make sure that you get rewarded for it in some way. And so we have this available for everybody in our company. The reason why we took this approach is uh, we think it's important for people to see examples on the board. Uh, we hope that they're listening to us when we're talking to them, and then they actually have to show off those skills when they're going to find uh, vulnerabilities in juice shops. So it's a combination of actually seeing and hearing things and then actually doing them too. So I feel like that really enforces uh, the training. The second part of our training is our secure code review. So this is meant uh, to serve as a reference for when they're doing uh, pull requests in the future. Uh, again, it's really important to tailor this stuff to your technologies. The OWASP uh, secure coding guidelines are a great starting point, but you also need examples and references that are based off of the types of things that your developers are going to encounter. Uh, if you're a company that uses Node, like Segment, uh, you don't need any Java examples because we don't do any stuff with Java. Um, this is also meant to reinforce the training from part one. Um, hearing things multiple times definitely helps your attention. So uh, these are a couple of the main things that we cover. Um, we actually don't see very much XSS, but we have a couple of instances where we found it, so we cover it in the training. Um, SSRF and DNS rebinding, this is something that if you're in the last session, uh, they talked a lot about. If you don't know what this is, uh, it's definitely very scary. You should look into it. We don't have time to really talk about it uh, right now, but we were recently on the Absolute AppSec podcast with Seth and Ken, um, and we talk about uh, SSRF and DNS rebinding. We talk about how we've approached this problem at Segment, and by we, I mean we had some engineers write some really good uh, software to solve this problem for us because they're smarter than we are. And what this does is it sits at the container level um, and it blocks any connections to any of our internal IP addresses. It does this after the IP has been resolved from the host name so we don't have to worry about things that are going through multiple uh, transformations to try and hide it. And this actually uh, recently got open source yesterday. Um, and so this is something that you can use uh, right now. There's also another piece, NetC, that is going to get released later this month that's going to make it easier for people that aren't using Golang. Um, but yeah, by the time that these videos get posted online, these will both be, uh, both be real. So our example for the secure coding guidelines, uh, this is uh, Leaf's Hawaiian Shirt Store, which was built by my coworker David. Uh, it's riddled with vulnerabilities, as you would expect, and uh, our developers are the ones that have to go and, and find these vulnerabilities in the code. So um, this is a really easy buying experience. You just see a shirt, and you put in your credit card number, and then you buy the shirt. So um, the goal here is to just provide people with some simple hands-on examples of what things from the training look like. So can anybody point out that doesn't work at Segment a vulnerability in this code written by David? Cost, perfect. That's in the order that I was hoping people would guess. And what's the other one? Credit card number? Yep, you don't want to put sensitive stuff in the URL. And most importantly, he spelled Hawaiian wrong. Um, <laughs> and then on the back end, this is server. Uh, you know, this is what it would talk to on the back end. Uh, who sees something that is uh, bad here? Slightly trickier. API key, okay, that one actually wasn't tricky. What's the other one? B to A. Uh, B to A is actually base64 encoding. It's not encryption. Um, we wouldn't actually expect a developer to know this, but we like to introduce the concept of security judgment, um, which is something that the Netflix talk I referenced earlier introduced. Um, and it's basically just like knowing when to look at stuff or knowing when to ask us for help or knowing when to talk to somebody senior on your team. So. We don't expect everyone to be an expert in every aspect of security. We're certainly not experts in every aspect of security. We Google stuff all the time. I'm sure everyone here Googles 
most of what they do in a day. Um, but we just want to instill that in our developers so that they know what to Google and who to ask. To make this easy for our devs, uh, one, of our, um, one of our engineers, Thomas, built this tool where you can just put in uh, you know, some references to your JIRA uh, project and then you can fill out some check boxes about what you're trying to do and then it will surface the information from the secure coding guidelines that's gonna be relevant and um, you know, what to check for. So a lot of the, uh, the benefits for our engineering uh, training is, can be summarized here. You get to meet people really early in their career at Segment. You get to show them, hey, the security team uh, is actually kind of cool. We're not going to say no to you. Uh, we want to partner with you on projects. Um, we introduce them to common vulnerability types that they might be likely to write it in their time at Segment and hopefully not write them. Um, I think this is one of the most important ones is uh, that concept of security judgment, knowing when to ask for help or knowing uh, you know, when to, to look something up and see if it's the right thing to do. And then we want them to think about PRs in new ways. And most importantly, we want them to have fun because they hang out with us for a few hours uh, during their onboarding, which is already a pretty lengthy process. Once you complete the training, you get an iHack sticker, which is kind of like I voted, but more fun. Um, and then you also get this Hacker Man sticker, which is just a dumb meme from Mr. Robot that gets referenced in our training. Uh, the next section is vendor adoption. So uh, how do you buy stuff and then get engineers to use it? Because we don't use a lot of our tooling. The tooling that we buy is actually for developers to use, and we want them to uh, use it easily, and we want them to help us make segments safer. So I want to talk about uh, a tool that we bought a while ago, SNCC. Um, SNCC helps companies identify vulnerabilities in their dependencies. If you, any of you work at a node shop, you realize that this is a huge problem because we have a lot of dependencies. This is important for every language, but very important for node. Um, so the way we started our eval is we tested this on various repos ourselves. We made sure that it had uh, the right feature set that we were looking for uh, from a language perspective. Um, and then we partnered with our app team early in the process. We didn't buy this without talking to other engineers. We want them to say, hey, this is usable because they're the ones that have to use it, not us. Um, once our app team said this looked good, we presented it at our engineering all hands and we tried to make it fun. Uh, we had them uh, write down on a piece of paper how many dependencies they thought we had across all of segment. And we did a Price is Right style prize. Uh, our team bought a crown, and then the winner was presented with a crown at all hands, and that definitely makes people pay a little bit more attention than just like, hey, uh, we're going to make you use this thing that we bought um, because people are, are actually using it. Um, and then we actually submitted our pull request to all of the core repos, so I probably added this to like 25 repos. And then um, since then, I think it's probably been added to close to 150 repos. And I didn't do any of that. Uh, we gave our engineers examples, and we said, hey, go look at these and talk to us if you need help. And then they've just done the rest. Uh, we also added it to like our initialization code for Go uh, repos. So any new Go repo that somebody makes, this just gets automatically added, and they don't even have to do anything. And then uh, really important is you want to make this information available to developers where developers are working. Um, and you don't want them to have to go look at all these different tools. Uh, so we wrote a tool with something that we use internally called directory. And you'll see here, uh, this has a bunch of other information. It has uh, data dog metrics. It has uh, stuff like other resources in AWS. And then it also has a security tab where you can see information um, from SNCC. We also, uh, you can see information uh, about some other security information that might be relevant to that repository or to that container. Um, and here you can see that there's actually no vulnerabilities. That's because one of our developers took it upon himself to get rid of all the vulnerable dependencies. Uh, we actually didn't ask him to do this. We were kind of still in the rollout phase. And Roland just came to us and he's like, hey, there's no more vulnerabilities in this thing. We're like, that's awesome because now we don't have to worry about that. And uh, having vulnerabilities in your dependencies is definitely something that we consider the security fundamentals. Uh, a lot of people, especially on Twitter, talk about the security basics. And I think that that is not a good name for it because the security basics are actually really hard. And a lot of companies have problems with the basics because they're not easy. And uh, like armchair Twitter quarterbacks love to talk about like, oh, this company got breached. They couldn't even do like X, Y, and Z. And it's like, 
yeah, those things are actually really hard. And I think that fundamentals is a better name because it's like playing sports is like play basketball, like shooting is a fundamental, but it's like it takes years and years to get to the point where you can shoot like Steph Curry. Um, another thing I want to talk about super briefly, bug bounty. Um, I'm not going to talk about how to run a bug bounty program. I'm not going to talk about if you should run one or not. There's been a million talks about that. I've even given some. But um, the couple things I want you to take away from this is think about the way that you run your program and pay for anything that gives value. If it's a dupe that gives value, pay that person for it. A lot of this stuff in the bug bounty program, uh, researchers don't make any money off of. There's a lot of work that goes into assessing a new target, reading the brief, writing up a finding. And if you can build a relationship with somebody that's going to provide value to you in the future, just pay them for their work up front. It's like a few hundred bucks for a dupe is almost nothing to your organization. We've gotten all of our most critical findings from people that we paid for dupes or for something early and then worked with and built a relationship. And then a few weeks later or something, they'll be like, oh, actually, we found this really critical thing. And uh, you know, we're, we're grateful that they, they told us about that. Uh, another way to think about that is if you're thinking about it, money on a per bug basis, you're probably thinking about your program in the wrong way. Because what other tool do you judge based off of like how much like each, each individual instance is providing value. It's like you should be thinking about the program as a whole based off of how much money you're spending and how does that compare to other security tools. Um, and once you start thinking about it that way, it's easy to rationalize like, oh, we'll pay this person 300 bucks for this well-written dupe. And then um, if anyone here is a bounty researcher, our program's going public in like five days or something. So if you want to uh, take a crack at it uh, while it's still private, feel free. You can use that link and just submit bugs. You don't uh, need to get invited or anything. You just need a bug crowd account. And then how does this translate into, uh, into JIRA? So you want to make things easy for people to fix. Uh, you need to have a good description. You need to have easy to follow reproduction steps. And most importantly, you need to have a severity description. If what you're writing up isn't something that a developer can understand the impact of uh, without too much help, you probably need to research this vulnerability more, or you need to write it up in a better way. Because uh, if a developer doesn't understand the same urgency that you've marked this with, they're probably not going to resolve it with the same urgency that you think it should be resolved with. And so uh, if that means meeting up with them to talk about the remediation criteria, or even the suggested remediation, that can be really helpful. It can be really difficult to understand like where this bug actually got introduced and like what this should actually be fixed and like what team this should go to. And you know, sometimes stuff does hop around a little bit. Uh, but if you're there to work with them through that process and be like, hey, this is actually uh, you know, how you should be doing it and we're here to help, uh, that goes a long way. Uh, the last like big chunk I have to talk about is the security engineering embed program. So uh, we talked with people from Coinbase, Etsy, and Twilio to uh, see how they do this process. So this is kind of just distilling um, our research from people that have done this uh, a lot more times than we have. So you want to follow the normal process. Uh, what that means is go through the normal software design process. Write software design docs. Have people that do this all the time look at them. Um, you need to get buy-in. Is this something that your org actually needs to build? Is this something that you're going to have developers that you can work with to actually build this with? Is this going to be uh, a key result for their team uh, for that quarter, for that you know, half year, or however long it takes you to build it. Uh, does this meet your company's standards for design? You need somebody that is probably a better front end programmer than you to help you figure out like, what this stuff is actually supposed to look like. Um, you need to write good test cases. You need to follow deployment procedures. And you need to actually feel like you're part of this team. So if you can go sit with them, that's great. If you can have one on ones with that manager, that's great. Uh, if you can go through their normal onboarding process, that's awesome. This isn't just free labor for an engineering team. Uh, you're not taking over a part of their product for them. You're actually going and sitting with that team and being part of that team for however long it takes to get this to build, to get built. And uh, so why did we do this? Why did we want to spend our security resources building stuff with other teams? Um, this is a great way to build empathy with developers. If you go through the same process that they go through, uh, you might find that the you know, security re review process sucks. And uh, if you can make changes to it from that other side, uh, it's going to be more usable for the developers that have to go through this all the time. 
It's also a great way to meet people. Uh, you'll meet a ton of people that are maybe outside of the circle that you normally work with. Um, when I went through this, I met with a bunch of designers I had never talked to. I met with a bunch of product managers. Um, I got a way better understanding of the engineering process. Um, and I also learned a lot about the code that I was helping to protect. So the next time we got a bounty submission, it was like, oh, I know where that part of the code is. Like, I didn't write that, but I was in that area, and I know uh, where that would be to get remediated. It also helps diversify your skill set. I think a lot of people in security like learning new things. I know that's one of the things that interested me about the industry. And this is another uh, area that you can, can learn and expand your knowledge. I just wanted to share a feature that I helped build. Um, this is my original design mockups. I used uh, colored pencil because I'm not a designer. Um, but after working with a bunch of people and uh, meeting with a bunch of people throughout our org and getting help, uh, this is what it ended up looking like. So it's pretty close. Um, <laughs> but I think this version is maybe a little bit better. Um, and so we use a combination of the Dropbox ZXC VBN password strength meter, um, as well as uh, the Have I Been Pwned API. So this is you know, a bad password on the left that you can't use. That's a decent password on the right. That's a pretty good password on the right. And then this is a breach password, which we actually do allow customers to use um, currently. But we do warn them, hey, this is something that's been in a breach somewhere else. So you might want to not use that. Um, but yeah, that uses Troy Hunt's API. So Troy, if you ever look at this, thank you. Your face is on the slides. Um, this is some stats from our password strength project. So the green is the old. And so uh, the bottom is the ZXCVBN score. Four is higher. Um, you can definitely see that there's a lot more fours than there were before. And this is a, a there's an equal number because this is uh, through the password change process. So you can actually see like what the old and new password were. Um, and then at the bottom, you can see there was a slight uh, reduction in the amount of people that are using breach passwords. I actually would have kind of expected that to go lower, but even 1.5% less people using breach passwords uh, for the scale of users that we have is, is pretty good. Um, so what are the main benefits? Uh, great way to meet people. Shows you can build useful tools and features. So when you're talking with an engineer, they understand like, hey, this person's actually pretty practical. They can kind of do a slightly worse version of the job that I do. Um, you learn about the engineering process, what the developers are going through in terms of constraints. Um, and then most importantly, bring this knowledge back to your team. Not everyone is going to have a chance to embed with every team. Um, but if you get the chance to tell your team how that team likes to work, that's going to help everybody out. Um, right now, the process is focused on security going to engineering, but we're working on something on bringing uh, engineers to security. Um, we found this, this is a really good way to bridge the gap, and uh, it really helps you build stuff, get stuff built in the future when you need stuff fixed or, or features written. Um, this is an area that I think would be a really good place to partner with developers. Um, developers solve really tough problems all the time. Um, this is a presentation from a couple guys at Datadog at LastCon. It talks about how they were able to use a slow legacy um, security uh, tool that runs on Windows and is in the static analysis space you've probably heard of. Um, and what they did is they use AWS step functions to run those jobs in parallel not slow down developers, not block in CI, and then come back and comment on the PR uh, to let the developers know if there are any issues. Um, this is a talk uh, on Absolute AppSec with John Melton, where he, he uh, discusses linting and other lightweight solutions to uh, slow security problems. Um, this would be great for catching something like dangerously set inner HTML, um, which is something that the two static analysis tools we tried didn't catch. Uh, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, and then the last one is Salus. We actually haven't looked too closely into Salus, but this is a project um, by Coinbase that they use as uh, a big chunk of uh, like how they think about scanning in their CI tooling. If you do need to uh, use these, hopefully you don't, but these are a couple things that you can use uh, in case you're really not able to get something fixed. Um, don't be the uh, team that cried compliance, but sometimes you can use this stuff to get stuff done. Um, and it can be really helpful. So just keep it in mind if uh, being friends 
and helping people the normal way doesn't work and, uh, and you need some firepower. So just to summarize everything, uh, I know we're over time, but uh, get involved in the local security community. Uh, it'd be great if more people could write blogs, uh, talk at conferences, uh, share your information. That's how the whole industry moves forward for stuff that you can't really talk about in public. Um, we've had a great time meeting with other security teams one-on-one uh, -on -one and just talking about the types of problems that we're solving. Um, we're all kind of working on the same things, just at like various levels of maturity. Um, use that involvement to uh, build the team that you want to work with. Having the right coworkers makes a huge difference. Um, my coworkers are right there, so I had to say that. But um, uh, no, our team is, has been really great to work with. It's, it's been awesome. Um, Vulnerabilities are just bugs. The more that developers think of vulnerabilities the same way they think about other broken stuff, uh, the easier it is to get them to fix it. Security is everybody's job. Uh, this isn't something that the security team can just make better. Developers have a way bigger impact on the security of a product because they're the ones that write all of it. Um, we're just there to help out and teach them security judgment, so knowing when to ask us uh, for stuff. And partner cross-functionally uh, in a meaningful way. Any big, think about any big project at your company. It's always going to touch multiple departments. It doesn't ha even have to be an engineering project. It could be like finance and legal or something. But it's like once your org gets to a certain size, like everything takes like multiple pieces. Um, look for ways to reduce your operational work. If you don't do that, uh, you're just going to get consumed by it. Uh, use some of your project time to reduce future operational overhead. Save your no's. Uh, don't be the department of no. Be the department of yes safely. Um, and most importantly, have fun with your developers. Uh, developers want to work with people that are easy to work with. Um, and so if you're easy to work with and you're part of uh, the fun parts of your company, people are more likely to want to work with you. And then uh, just some closing thoughts. Uh, everybody here knows that security isn't something that you just buy or hire people for and have it magically improve. Um, like every tough challenge, uh, whether that's reliability, performance at scale, having a diverse workforce, it requires cultural change within your org. You need support from throughout the org, and that means executives, managers, and individual contributors. Um, it isn't security versus development. We're all on the same team, and you've got to hire the right people that can work with engineering and the rest of the org because you need support from the whole company. Uh, you'll need engineers to fix stuff and write features. You need people to report suspicious emails and get in the habit of locking their computer and stopping tailgaters. And uh, most importantly, we're all trying to provide something great for our customers, uh, whether that's new features, customer service, or peace of mind that their data is safe. So um, with that, uh, this is the, the show notes. Um, we're hiring at Segment, so if this has uh, convinced you that this is a place you want to work, there's a lot of us around. Uh, you can talk to us about our experiences and I am way over time limit, so I am going to stop, but I will be over there, and I will let you prevent me from eating lunch if you want to ask me questions. So um, thank you.